Okay, with Akira Takarada in the background, here I am reporting from GFAST 2010 for this edition of OC the Webcast. Now, speaking of OC, it's an interesting situation because for once, OC the Webcast and OC the Magazine actually do coexist. By that I mean earlier this month I actually released OC the Yun Wu Ping issue. But anyway, as for this episode of OC the Webcast, the obligatory vintage review will be that of Iron King, but first we start off with an interview with Brett Hominick. Here we are with Brett Hominick, who's written for not only Oriental Cinema, but of course G-Fan, and he's appeared in such films as Martyr X and Devil's Dragons and Bloodsucking Bats. So tell me, how did you first get into Asian cinema? Back in about 1986 or so, I found a VHS copy of Godzilla vs. Megalon on a double bill with a movie called The Snow Creature back in some video store, basically. And my brother was into King Kong and a lot of the universal horror films at the time. And when I expressed some interest in Godzilla, which was a character that I had heard of but never seen, my brother expressed all sorts of skepticism and said, don't get that movie, it's not going to be any good, don't bother with it, it's kid stuff. And we bought it anyway, took it home, watched it, and he probably liked it even more than I did at the time. Uh, we were just instantly converted to Godzilla fans, and I remember we, we were living in an apartment complex at the time, and uh, one of our neighbors had a monster book. So we often borrowed that just to look up information on the various films, and you know that's how we found out that Godzilla was in a lot of other films, and that he was also a villain as well as a good guy. And our second film was actually King Kong vs. Godzilla, in which Godzilla appears as a villain, although there's a lot of comedy in that film anyway. So it was an interesting juxtaposition that first we had Godzilla as a bona fide hero, and we followed that up with Godzilla as a villain, destroying cities and killing people and everything else. So that was a lot of fun. So, so for your generation, you first discovered him on VHS, whereas an old geezer like me, I used to watch him on syndicated TV. I don't know how many of you remember that. How did you first discover the magazine Oriental Cinema? Really, just by word of mouth. The first time I heard it, I was actually, believe it or not, at a Raven White show. Raven White, a.k.a. Roger Shy. And it wasn't even the magazine that I really heard about first. It was actually a VHS tape that you made of ALF, where you dubbed over the character but left everybody else's voices intact. So I really first discovered this person named Damon Foster as somebody who made videos of, you know, funny jokes, dirty jokes, that sort of a thing. And I was told that it was done by a guy named Damon Foster, who happened to be the editor of this magazine called Oriental Cinema. And of course, David McRoby, who was also another OC contributor, talked highly of you and the magazine over the years. And it was just a magazine I never really saw or really discovered until years later. And I actually started emailing you in 2003, knowing a little bit about you and wanting to get a little bit, you know, more knowledgeable about you and what you've done. And so I started to get more curious about the magazine. And so I sought it out on eBay. And I remember the first time I, I got a copy of OC was I discovered a, a guy selling four copies, one of which was issue number number four of the Draculina run, which of course is the legendary Godzilla issue, in which uh, Robert Biondi and Dan Reed both had their lengthy reviews cut short by uh, your editing prowess, shall we say. So uh, that was a lot of fun, and you know, from there the issues just kept going and going and going. I discovered more of them, and of course when you started attending G-Fest in 2005-2006, I basically almost completed my run of the Draculina issues. And not only that, but I also have older issues of OC, as you can see here. This is a fairly older issue. I believe I got this one from David McRoby. And as you can see, the table of contents right here, perhaps you can see that right there, is actually a table, which I found very interesting. And uh, hey, it even gets older than that because yes. right here, oh yes, oh yes, I've oh. got this. Look at this. Ta oh, oh, who's that? Can you see that? All right, cameraman, zoom it. Look, it's a young Damon Foster here, and uh, I think this is the issue where maybe Bill Goodmanson and some others tell you, you know, how you need to, you know, learn the English language basically a little bit better. So anyway, so I've got this very old issue, as you can see, 1977. Now, the interesting thing is you always say that OC was created in 1978. Well, this may disprove that because it says right here, 1977. So, you know, and that also, look, I've got other issues, as, as you can see right here, just uh, completing my collection. And of course, I even have this. Uh, Markalite magazine for which you contributed an article on Lady Battlecock. Yeah, it was sort of a sister publication that lasted for about three issues made by August Ragoni and Bob Johnson. Yes, absolutely. And then, of course, there is also G-Fan, um, otherwise known as B-Fan, I suppose, but uh, we won't get into that. That's for a different subject, for a different time. And um, I'm a B-Fan. That's right, and so should you. 
And so, yeah, I mean, you know, the one thing that I really did like about OC, though, was that you really had the persona of the starving artist, which I really liked. You talked about, oh, yes, you talked about how you um, had difficulties, you know, financially making ends meet. And you just sort of had that uh, had that image. You came across as the starving artist, somebody who sacrificed a lot just for his craft and to make something uh, work, something that he believed in. And I thought that was very interesting. I was almost envious of you. Just imagine you scraping by just so you could do OC, something that you truly believed in. I was more of a thirsty artist, but then I started drinking beer and I was okay. Oh, excellent. That's a good plan. So yes, I mean, Oriental Cinema is something that I've enjoyed since about 2003, ever since I got my first copies on eBay, and it's just been something that I've enjoyed ever since. This episode's vintage review comes from 1991's OC number 13 and is a critique of one of my favorite TV shows, the 1972 Japanese program Iron King. At a time when many post-Ultraman programs were bogged down with scientific technicalities, these 26 episodes evaded the constraints of a lower-than-average budget by concentrating on action and humor. Let's see what I wrote about Iron King back in 1991. In Iron King, when the forces of good and evil aren't clashing, the dramatic plot development commonly lingering in such programs is replaced by comedy. I mean, sure, when villains hassle people and or giants stomp on buildings, it's no laughing matter. Yet the human here otherwise laugh it up from scene to scene. I loved this co-production between Sankosha and Nippon Gendai planning even back then, when all we had was untranslated VHS bootlegs. So you can imagine how much more I love Iron King now that we have the subtitle DVDs from Mill Creek Entertainment. What you are seeing now are some rare behind the scenes outtakes from the set of Iron King. So as you can see, the humor and shenanigans continued even after the director said cut. Here you'll see the program's two stars, Mitsuo Hamada and Shoji Ishibashi, who was also in the Edo no Gekito series, and they're handling a birthday cake whilst attempting to sing Jingle Bells. Don't ask me why. Regardless, this humorous tale of good guys versus bad guys again gets five stars for me. I recommend Iron King to fans of both giant monsters and martial arts alike. Um, we got about a minute to kill, and so I think I'm going to try another one of my mousetrap pranks with a couple of friends of mine, and this will be the last time I will ever do a stupid mousetrap prank, but we're going to see if anyone can grab a toy monster with his eyes closed. This is Mike Keller from Monster Attack Team. I really hope I'm going to get a cool toy. <laughs> And that you did. I got a cool toy. You like that? You got a Rodan. Yeah. Yeah, do it again. All right. Okay, the tension is building. Ooh. Yeah. Ah. Oh. Oh. Good for you. Okay, that's. I'm not doing it anymore. My name is Mike O'Brien, my otherwise known as Tarantula, 1984. Close your eyes. And I am the. One responsible for uh, Slave Girls of Reptilon. Go for it. All right. Grab a toy. (laughs) 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 